Hey, party people. We're always looking for suggestions, questions, and confessions. So if you have any topics you'd love to hear about, any burning money questions you'd like to ask, or you're ready to confess your deepest, darkest money secret, go on ahead and leave us a voicemail on the party hotline. To find the party hotline, go to moneypartypodcast.com, click in the show notes, or the link in our Instagram will take you there. And we would love to hear the good stuff. Hello, you money makers, savers, hoarders, and if you're anything like us, spenders. Here on The Money Party, we don't just talk about budgets and financial planning. We also dive deep into the things that keep us from living a financially free life. From financial mindset to mental health and why we try to keep up with the Joneses. Or should we now say the Kardashians? On today's show, we talk about money and anxiety with Kimberly Quinlan, a licensed family therapist who specializes in anxiety and many other disorders. We dig into what anxiety is, where it comes from, and the symptoms to look for to identify if you have it. We touch on the topic of kids and money, and she suggests one simple thing you can say to the kids when they are always asking you to buy them something. Let's get this party started. Kimberly, you all set? Looking good, feeling good. Shelby's looking good as always, and I'm feeling good. So are you ready to get this party started? It's party time. All right. We have Kimberly Quinlan. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist, specialized in anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders, eating disorders, and body focused repetitive behaviors. She provides one-on-one treatment and online courses for those who are struggling in these areas. Kimberly has been featured in many world-renowned and prestigious media outlets, such as the Washington Post, the LA Times, the Wall Street Journal, KCRW Public Radio, the Seattle Times, and the Australian newspapers. Let's just say that, Kimberly, you're a boss. (laughs) I am? I want to be a boss. Yay, you made my day. Boss. (laughs) And that fake accent you have really got you into that Australian newspaper pretty well huh it totally did it totally did that was my in actually I was shocked I got into that that was like a big deal for me so Kimberly we are excited to hear about your book that you just wrote yeah so I I um I by coincidence got asked to write a book on OCD which is my main specialty right when coronavirus pandemic started p.s not not the best idea to write a book during a COVID pandemic um, but I tried and I did. So yes, I, have- I feel like you would have tons of time to just focus on your writing. No, mental health providers like all freaked out at the beginning of pandemic, like, oh, we're going to lose all our business. And it was the opposite. Like, I bet. We're wiped. Like I'm wiped still. I feel like I need a year to get over 2020 um, from how busy it was. So yes, taking on all of like all your old clients wanted to come back and then writing a book and also managing all your own uncertainties around it. Um, it was a big deal, but yes, I did finish a book. So I'm very proud of that. It's called the self-compassion workbook for OCD. Well, congratulations. That's so exciting. It's interesting that you talk about the business flipped right during 2020. Mm -hmm. And I'm not surprised. There were some people that really struggled during 2020 and um, I know I had my my moments, right? I'm sure you had yours too, babes. I- well, it's weird because we've spent so much time apart in our normal careers. You know, Shelby travels a lot. I travel uh, all the opposite times when she's home. So it's kind of, uh, it, we got used to like being with each other again, mm-hmm. which was kind of uh, very stressful. And, um, you know, I think <laughs> we- if, if the suggestion to see somebody about our issues and problems came up, I probably would have obliged because... <laughs> You know, it's like, am I not that bad? (laughs) No, because I'm I'm a big couples counselor advocate. I think there's two ways that people cope and some with anxiety um, who's who had anxiety pre COVID were totally overwhelmed because their old cues and old skills weren't there to be used. And then the other people who found life anxiety provoking were had relief because they didn't have to face their anxiety anymore. So it seemed to be that some did really well and some really didn't um, from my experience. That's a great point because as an extrovert, I look at it as 
I can go out now and see people. <laughs> I'm not trapped inside. And then I, the moment you said that, I was like, wait a minute. Some people don't like that. Some no. people don't like going around people. And like, that's kind of their worst nightmare. So right. very interesting to hear that. Well, I can relate because I'm the introvert and I'd be more than happy to be at mm-hmm. home, do my own thing, take care of me, myself and I. Like, that's just who I am and not worry about that social awkward conversation and just putting all my energy out there. Yeah. But what's crazy is, you know, I appreciate stopping, slowing down because we were before the end of it, it was go, 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 go. It was nonstop. We were booked. Almost, <laughs> if it wasn't for work, then we were booked for weekend hangs, evening hangs, sports. It was nonstop. And so to actually stop and just take life in and realize what's important to you hmm. was amazing. And I told Lee, cause we had to quarantine for a couple of weeks just due to his job. And I told Lee, I go, I'll stay home any day by myself, that's fine. But as soon as somebody tells me I have to do it, yep. that's another problem. <laughs> yep. 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 Therefore, no. the rise of breads and casseroles. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and upped uh, liquor buying. <laughs> yes. Liquor is up for sure. Yes. Um, um, well, I, I think as, as I was going through the show and trying to figure out, you know, my uh, approach, my biggest question is, what is anxiety? You know, what is it? Right. Well, I think what I think what you're um, talking about is true in that we tend to generalize what we're feeling and use a very extreme version, right? So it's like, oh my God, I'm freaking out when really you're not freaking out. You're just really like surprised. You know what I mean? Or I'm totally freaking out. I've got anxiety when you're instead, maybe you're feeling the feeling of fear. Like there's these baseline fear, um, emotions, anxiety, anxiety, isn't fear. Um, anxiety is more of like a maladaptive version of fear, right? So everybody has fear. If you know, your son went to touch the burner on the kitchen hot plate, you would experience fear and that would project you and propel you towards stopping them and keeping them safe. Anxiety tends to be more irrational and repetitive Mm. and can impact people's functioning. Um, And so it's more of like a clinical term. Fear is a feeling like sadness, you know, guilt, shame, you know, joy, disappointment, just emotions. But anxiety is more what we would consider to the degree that your fear, that think of your fear as like an alarm bell like a a fire alarm, Um, if there is danger, your fire alarm should go off, right? right? That's fear. If there isn't danger and your fire alarm's going off for things that aren't really dangerous, well, then it's probably anxiety. Are are you born with it or are you not born with anxiety? Both. We We don't have a lot of certainty on that, but they do know it to be both. So there is a strong genetic component for people with anxiety disorders, Um, but it's also... Um, nature and nurture, right? So I use the example is if if every time a car drove past my house and I went, <gasps> my pe- kids would soon learn to be afraid of cars driving past because yeah. they would learn from me that that must be a danger, right? Because of my reaction. So it could be genetic. It could be entirely environmental. Most commonly, it's a combination, right? Um, by no fault of parents or anybody, like I try not to mix blame into that because we're all just humans doing the best we can. But, you know, society can project fear onto us. Um, Money being one of those, right? So yeah, yeah, absolutely. It can be learned. That's interesting because I I was thinking about this call and I was like, you know, I wonder where my, I've felt anxiety before just listening to the way you've talked about it, but I started to write some other stuff down and I've realized that I don't think it's anxiety. If you, you know, you mentioned money, money's a big anxiety ridden thing. I started to write down my, I don't want to call it mindset, but just the way I feel if it's mentioned mm-hmm. or if Lee buys something. And I'm wondering if it's more of an OCD side for me now, just listening to how you're speaking to anxiety. You think of it like a spectrum on the spectrum, are these different disorders, they all present similarly in that the alarm bell goes off too early in your brain and it's usually based on a theme. So in some people, the alarm bell may be set off around like, will I be judged by others? And they have anxiety and they do these behaviors to try and remove or reduce that anxiety. That's social anxiety. Right? I have that. There you go. <laughs> you, if, the, if the alarm bell rings around health, right? 
that you have the anxiety around, am I or am I not going to die or get ill or terminal illness? And then you do a certain amount of behaviors to reduce or remove that anxiety. That's called a hypochondria. With OCD, it's more, it's very broad, right? And it's more severe, not more severe, but can be. Um, but that's often around these other sort of topics. Then there's just basic generalized anxiety, which is around daily stresses. And you're, But your brain sets off an alarm about these daily stresses. What if you run out of money? What if we don't pay the bills on time? What if someone gets hurt? What if, you know, so... And that's still the same process. There's the thought around daily stresses and then there's the reaction to try and remove or reduce that anxiety. So the, the patterns are the same. It, the diagnosis depends on the theme. Mm -hmm. okay. that yeah, that's Shelby to the T, what you just described. <laughs> Going back a little bit about poop in your pants. <laughs> that is me pro previously before um living with Shelby like that's how I felt with bills I would get a bill and I would yeah. literally just be like put it away yeah. I'm gonna go poop my pants because yeah. I knew it was something I couldn't afford or I knew it was mm -hmm. something that was going to impact my routine if you notice yourself um learning anxiety or gaining anxiety um are there any kind of steps you can take or processes that you could think of to start helping you like self-diagnose maybe or self-cope mm -hmm. before it gets too out of hand right well i think the let's look at the fear first and then we can look at the skills so the fear is usually going to cause you to do one of a few behaviors so one would be straight up avoidance it's the simplest method you got something you're afraid of you avoid it that's what humans mm -hmm. do yeah. right and that's what you were doing right you you saw it you gently pushed it along the counter and you were like, I'll talk to you tomorrow or next month. Right. So that's just general avoidance and that works. Um, but for the short term, not so great for the long term. Um, another way of dealing with anxiety is that we seek reassurance instead. So, you know, you might, you know, it, you, did I do that right? It, am I going to be okay? Will I run out of money? Will I, you know, will this be fine? Um, maybe you Google it like, you know, it cannot, yeah. will I go bankrupt, that kind of stuff. Yep. So that's, that's more reassurance seeking, right, behaviors as, a, as an attempt to remove or reduce your anxiety and uncertainty, right? Um, there are other ways some people cope, which is sort of like hoarding money or, or recounting money or, you know, Selby. checking. <laughs> yep. I'm Checking. a hoarder. I'm a money hoarder. Moving from one pile to the yep. other pile. Yep. Or from one bank again. account to another bank account. Yeah. That's me. Right. right. So so you're you're doing these behaviors to get a sense of control and certainty, right? Um, so that's one other behavior. And then the final, well, actually, there's two more. What, the final big one is mental ruminations, which is just mental looping over it, right? So maybe you're in avoidance. So you first do the avoidant, push the, the bill across the table. And then while you're wanting to chill out, you're like looping on it. Oh my God, when am I going to do it? What do bad things happen? And those sort of things. And then the final one, which is less related, but is very prevalent, which is beating yourself up for it. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm such yes. a loser. I should be better with money. I should have more money. I should, you know, all the things. Yep. So, so there are ways that it presents. Um, in, uh, in terms of managing it, it's actually quite simple, <laughs> which is um, for those so this will who be know, a short podcast then. <laughs> <laughs> um, for people who know me and know that work I do, I have a very short motto that I use every single client, every single person that follows me on my podcast, which is it's a beautiful day to do hard things. <laughs> Right. Hold on, hold on. It's on. Oh, you see it? Yeah. It's on my wall. It's a beautiful look. I've been put KQ. It's a beautiful day to do hard things. Yes. Um. <laughs> it it was it was not supposed to be a catchphrase, but it just some for some reason came out one day, and a bunch of people were like, "Oh my God, you need to make a T-shirt with that on it. I need to hear that." And the whole point of that is, I treat anxiety disorders all day, severe anxiety disorders all day. The only way you will have long-term recovery from fear is to face your fears. Does that suck? Yes. You know, do you want to do these hard things? No. But by doing hard things, you actually, and you explained this perfectly, is by doing the hard thing, you felt empowered. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. By doing the hard thing, you realized I can do hard things, right? When we avoid hard things, we can't, we have the belief I can't do hard things. And so this is ultimately just a switch in mentality of, of going, yes, this is hard. No, I don't want to do it, but I can still do hard things. Yes. I can relate to that so much a, because you had made that quote and I quickly jotted it down, printed it up, threw it on my wall because I was in the process. Well, we were in the process of starting the podcast and it was so scary to me and it was hard. And your quote kind of pushed me over that hump. And so thank you for that. Yes, Cause I, now I look at it every single day. I'm like, Hey, what's the hard thing that I'm going to do today. But that yes. feeling of empowerment after you do it mm-hmm. is amazing. And I'm sure Lee saw it in me too. Mm-hmm. Once I recorded the trailer or once I uploaded it, it was like, Oh, the sign of relief. And just, yep. I did it and excitement. Your, uh, your quote has really helped me actually through a lot of a lot of things. Same lately, so. as well. I've had, um, there's a director that I've worked with quite often that says uh, almost the exact same thing. Like, hey, it's going to be hard, but you're going to learn from it and do better the next time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, it is so empowering, like to put it into terms of like college me, when you p- finally do pay that cell phone bill and right. all the late fees that have accumulated, <laughs> when you finally pay it, you're like, I can't. Hell yeah. yeah. I'm the champion of money and bills. I'm yeah. an adult. <laughs> like when you pay off that debt, booyah. But what That's I'm right. saying is that that feeling of empowerment, you're like, yeah. I can pay a bill. Yeah. Give me yeah. the next bill. I'll not That's pay right. it. Right. Let's talk a little bit more about anxiety and money. And I don't know how much you can reference, but just from your experience and working with patients, how have you seen anxiety and money go hand in hand? I think... Um, someone, a a philosopher, and I can't think of who it was said, um, your relationship with life is exactly your relationship with sex and money. And I thought that was so profound. Mm -hmm. Um, if you like, that's how free you are, that's how much joy you have and so forth. And I thought that was very interesting because if I reflect for me, um, I had, I had, and have had and still do, I guess, a lot of anxiety around money, if I'm being really honest. Um, and that money is everywhere, Yeah. right? Um, money. And so if when you're anxious about money, you're anxious about almost everything, right? Yeah. Because it's, you know, being anxious about money means that if you go on your birthday to Disneyland, you're still thinking about how much money you're spending. So it's hard to enjoy your birthday. Um, you know, if you're buying a house, if you're, you yeah. know, you're thinking even the idea of retiring is scary. If you've got anxiety around money, even though retirement should be like when you chill. Right. Yeah. Um, so we could talk about sex, but we're here to talk about money. <laughs> um, That's the next episode. We do, we, we do have a topic. Our night is open. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a sex money party. <laughs> Sex money party. Oh no! <laughs> Writing That's the this next down. one of ideas. You know. <laughs> so um, we do have a, a thing that we like to explore. It's called getting financially naked. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that might have something to do with uh, money too. So if you spend money freely, maybe you uh, prefer to spend other things freely. Like well, but I don't spend money freely. So, <laughs> well, that's more talking when they say it about sex, they're talking about pleasure, really, right? So, if right. you're someone who's really open to pleasure and you're a, a receiver of pleasure, um, then you can spend money freely and you can receive love freely and you can have joy freely. Sorry, and- babe. <laughs> hey, I, th- I, I was saying that's me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, for me, um, I, um, I grew up on a farm in in um, Eastern Australia where everything was about money. We talked about money at the table. Every uh, My whole childhood was money related, which is why I, I love business, right? Um, I was raised to be in business. That's what my whole family does. But now was that um, money related in the sense of like, let's look at the budget, this is how we're doing it. Or is it more of, oh, we got to cut this out because we can't do this or more of like that scarcity side, or was it more of the managing mm, the money side? Managing money. I mean, the thing to, I, the main thing I've done a lot of therapy about money. So it's like all <laughs> processed, it's all worked out. 
the thing for me is I grew up in a farm. Your the year's income was based on the weather. If we had a good weather year, we made a lot of money. And if you had a bad weather year, you made no money or you went under, you know, for that year. And that was constantly talked about. And I was at a young age exposed to that. So for me, there, I think as an adult, I realized that I kept thinking that money was going to come or go this year instead of like recognizing that I'm not a farmer and I don't have to think that way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but but my little t- nine-year-old brain didn't get that. <laughs> so as an adult, it was still like, this could be the year I lose all my money instead of going like, I'm on a salary. How's it? How's this? Ch- how's the, how does this relate to you? But um, there's rain in the forecast. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's totally you that, true. You had that on the Mac anxiety. <laughs> oh, and, and has always been there. And I think the other thing is, and this would be another like tip for anxiety, which is, you know, I, I tell my teen clients this, and I often have conversations with my husband and we have young children is like, do not let me forget to sit down with my kids and show them how to do stuff. Because I, my parents talk yes. to me a great deal about money, but I don't think they showed me how to do taxes or what a deductible is, or yeah. like the importance of putting money away for retirement. So I think they told me by telling me, but didn't show me. And so mm-hmm. now I look back and be like, I could have had such less anxiety if I had of just someone walk me through that. Like it would have taken one weekend and yeah. I would have rolled my eyes the whole time, but I would have at least known what was, what the hell was happening. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. I find myself often being like, instead of telling the kids, no, right now is not the time or you don't need that right now. I always go, sorry, we can't afford it. We can't right. afford it. We can, but right. I my instinct you is tell to that say, to me and it drives me crazy we can't afford it <laughs> even though we can and i it's just the wrong terminology i mean affordability is a very vague term but yeah when you say we can't afford it like that has a connotation of like there's no yes, way it's yeah. happening i know but yeah and the reality is is the reason i don't want to give it to them is because they don't always need something so instead right. of having that conversation i'm just like we can't afford it yeah and, you know, that I grew up similar. Did your mom say that? All the time. Yep. All the time. Yeah. But I also grew up in a, a time where we didn't talk about money. And if we did, it was, oh, we don't have enough. Or, right. you know, I would see my mom go to the grocery store and we would only get generic foods. And again, mom, I love you dearly. You were a single mother and took care of me and my brother. But Badass, Annie Oakley. She's the bomb.com. <laughs> um, and, but again, you know, our parents just didn't educate us back then. And that's just the reality of it. And so that's how I grew up and I learned and I find myself doing the same thing with the kids. And so I'm trying to be more conscious of that and and not lead them down that path. Well, and that's the thing I think too, and I'm grateful for it is my parents also were very frugal with money, even though they had money. And I think I learned that from them too, right? Of like, even to this day, this is so funny. I actually caught myself doing this this morning is- my son left his light on and at lunchtime I came to his room and his light was on and I like had a little freak out because I was like, oh, that's costing us money. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I remember my parents saying for every day that we leave the lights on, it costs us 20 something cents or something or whatever it was. And so, I mean, that's, but they were really thinking of, they taught it as a way of like being smart about money. This is how yeah. you be smart with money, smart with money, which I'm so grateful for. But, you know, I think that, and I think this is the truth and I will be open here is I don't think my kid, my sisters and my sister and my brothers have anxiety about money. I think I internalized it as anxiety because I'm an anxious person. I don't know if they, they were raised the same. They may have not had taken that narrative, but I definitely did. Right. Um, that sort of nature versus nurture, right. Is I think yeah. my genetics sort of set me up to be like, like yeah. where's the money going? So, and you um, said at the very beginning that it's, uh, you know, it's unknown whether you're born with it or not, but a lot of it has to do with what you learn as you're growing up. Right. right. And we oh, are so much. And uh, yeah, our parents, God bless them, did the best they could yeah. with what they had. And, right. you know, we right. are a product of them and every, all of our, everything's we've learned is rooted in them. I wouldn't say solely based on them, but rooted in what we've observed from them. Yeah. I, I mean, I think we, you know, money, you know, the hard thing too, and I'll talk, reflect is money also is, it can be, and I'm sure you've maybe even discussed this is, is it's also related to status. So there's anxiety, you know, you talked about social anxiety before, 
if you have social anxiety, you're also going to have anxiety about money because money, how that impacts how you're judged by other people. It's how you may be perceived by other people. We live in Los Angeles. It's a much bigger deal here on what car you drive. That's like a status thing here. So mm-hmm. I think yeah. money, money here too. And this has been a big lesson for me is it money, money. It's not just money that makes you anxious. It's what is what it means about your identity, which can create the anxiety as well. You might be totally fine with money. My husband is like, ah, we don't need it. It's all good. Like, you know, we can have some, we don't have to have some, we'll be yeah. fine. <laughs> and for me, I'd be like, I would be a bad, unsuccessful human if we didn't have any money. And that that's where I'm, my relationship to money has been. Yeah, we've definitely delved into that in a couple of episodes. Mm. Um, and I'm sure it's going to be ever present. And, you know, well, I think it's something discuss. that needs to be talked about. The idea of keeping up with the Joneses is yeah. if you don't, people don't talk about it. And I think it needs to be discussed. The, right. it, I think it's a huge, huge role in the way that we view ourselves as successful. Um, and that's a lot of times, I, if I'm correct, this is statistics show a lot of people get into debt because of that reason. Well, I, before I met you guys, we lived in an apartment that was um, just under 600 square foot apartment. It was oh. teeny. That's um, a like one it, in Hollywood. We were no, we were living in the 600 square foot apartment. It was oh, 800. when we when we were living by you, ours, no, was, ours was smaller <laughs> than that one. Ours was way smaller than yours, and but the guy next to us who also paid seven hundred dollars a month was driving a Mercedes. Mm-hmm. You know, and so we would be like, "Where? Why? Why? What? What's happening here?" And he's like, "I gotta, I, you know, I gotta." keep you know this is how I keep up at work right if I'm driving Mercedes they'll respect me more we were like you know we're you're in a like what like we couldn't we couldn't quite wrap our head around it because for us that didn't match right Right. yeah you know miss people who drive Mercedes in our mind my husband and I we were like if you drive Mercedes you live three blocks south up here you know what I mean Um, it's not uncommon you go to any apartment complex Mm -hmm. um condominium place and it's like Yeah. yeah and I always right. equate it to priorities like, hey, like, yeah, uh, you know, having that car is more important to me than a place, you know, a larger place to accommodate right. or, you know, right. maybe investing in a home. Right. Well, and this is the thing to say. Let me let me just make sure I add this is I don't judge anybody for that. That might actually be them being free of money worries. Right. Like I want to live in an apartment where I don't have the money stress and I just want a bomb ass car like yeah. that's awesome. That's where we talk about value. So a big part of the work I do with anxiety is never let anxiety make your decisions. Always okay. make your your values make your decisions. So if you can, you know, the, the basic question is what would non-anxious Kimberly do or what would non-anxious <laughs> Lee do is if if I didn't have anxiety about money and that meant I could have an apartment, just rent an apartment, but have the best car because I'm really into cars, that's fine. Yeah. Right. Whereas some people are making it because of uh, an anxiety-based decision, like I'll have to get the car because I'm so afraid of people judging me and then I can't afford a nicer apartment. That's a, it's, It depends for the person and their values. Yeah, yeah you've posted that on your Instagram. I've, I watch every one of your video posts all the time, just so you know. <laughs> um, Thank you. But uh, it, it leads me to ask a question that we ask all of our guests. What does uh, being financially free mean to you? Well, to me, it's where, um, just like I said, fear doesn't make the decision. Um, because I've had a, an immense degree of anxiety around money, every day, every year, I get a little more free from anxiety around money. And that's because I don't make decisions based on that fear, right? When I was making decisions based on fear, I would cling to money and I would control it and I would get really bitchy about it and jealous or um, hoard money. I'm like, I'm like a Shelby true and true. (laughs) Right. Um, and so for now it's, it's, there's an ease, right. There's an ease with it where it's like, you can come and leave, you can come and go as you please. I have a belief that it will keep coming. And that was a big shift for me compared to like, it, it will soon run out and I must have enough to get me through 40 years kind of thing. That's a good shift. Hold on. I want to go back to something that she had said. So um, you, you talked about, don't let fear make that decision. One thing that I've been practicing is if I want to buy something, I ask myself, is this for me? Is it going to make me happy? 
Am I going to enjoy this two weeks from now, two months Mm -hmm. from now, Mm -hmm. possibly even a year from now, or am I buying this to prove something to somebody else? Or Mm -hmm. am I buying this for somebody else to look at me a different way? Right. And so I've been putting myself through that and it's helped tremendously. Yeah. That's like Marie Kondoing your, your, your money mindset, (laughs) right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's true. Like, How does this make me feel like, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And sometimes it's hard. And this is the thing to remember is that I tell my clients is sometimes you have two opposing values. You might have the value of saving and the value of pleasure at the same time. And you're like, well, which that's what I I have both. (laughs) Yeah. And so you, you, and that's where you kind of have to go, well, again, I'm not going to make this decision on the perfect decision air quotes for the listeners. It's just, it just, it can be imperfect. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Oh, that's okay. I forgot what I was saying. Oh, no, I do recall now. Um, so when you, because uh, you say that on uh, on Instagram in your videos, you say, you know, like, what would I do right now if fear wasn't a factor, right? And you said that you, every year you get better at realizing that you're not going to uh, make your decisions based on fear. Now, have you been without since then? Without fear? No, without uh, money or happiness. Like, because you fear the the absent of, right? Like, oh, I'm not going to have money. That's why you make particular decisions. Mm-hmm. And maybe I'm not wording this correctly. But, you know, you have this fear of like, I'm going to hoard it. I'm going to collect it. Uh, I'm going to worry about this. I'm going to do that. But since you started to ease your grasp, has anything slipped away? Or would you say you've maybe gained more money, became more wealthy in a sense? Both. Both. I think I I tell my clients this story all the time is um, a few months ago, my husband rented a car and he got, um, he rented the car for a certain amount of days and he didn't end up using it for all the days. So he returned it early and they said they were going to cut the last few days off. And it was a more luxury car. And then when he got the bill and he saw it on his bank account, they charged him for all the full days. And he, he and I had this really cool conversation around, do I let go and just say, screw it, it you know, I, I can't be bothered sitting on the phone for that many hours to solve this problem? Yeah. Or does that amount of money, do I value that money more and do I invest my time? And we had this conversation around the value of time over the value of money. And it was really cool because back in my day, I would be like, you get your ass on that phone right now. And you call <laughs> that would be me. I'm, no, that's why I'm loving this story. I want to know what happened because you're just, right. you're describing Shelby and I with almost every transaction. In fact, right. today I was like, you need to see if we can get that last day taken off the hotel that we're going to, cause we're not going to be there. And, and, I'm, like, and I'm, I'm like a like, hundred bucks. I'm like, it's a hundred bucks. Like right. it's just right. let them have it. Like it's okay. <laughs> Right, Where, right. You know, and I don't mean, I'm not saying that in like a mean way. It just, it's no, my anxiety. But yeah, we're both yeah. super busy. Like the last thing I needed to do today was call a place in the mountains and explain my situation, uh, right. why I'm leaving early and we need to cancel one day on Easter Sunday. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, let her finish right. her story. No, no, I, that's exactly. And that was, it was for me, it was, it was actually a moment, you know, I actually had a conversation with another clinician about this is sometimes you don't know you're recovered until you have these moments where you catch yourself going, you're right. Just screw it. Like, don't even worry about it. You know what I mean? Like your, your time's (laughs) too, your time is too valuable. Right. Yeah. Now the reason I say it's both is there's probably been many, many times where I have penny pinched for less than my hourly rate. Like I could have worked that hour and made more money. Yeah. Just to save a small amount of money. So for me, it's cost me more money because I'm more like more likely to be like, yeah, time is more valuable than this. But it also has given me enough space in my life to not be so burnt out and to be able to make more money and to see more clients and so forth. It's funny you say that because the other day I had this this thought. I was thinking about getting something. I'm like, I would have to work five hours in order to get that. Is it worth it? Like I start relating. Yeah. It, how much time would I have to work to, to get this thing? Yeah. And is it really worth it? I don't know. Right. I don't know if that's the right approach, but that was the thought that ran through my mind. Right. Well, and I'll say the thing I read something, maybe it was early COVID 
that shook me to my core, which was a quote by Dalai Lama, and I'm going to kill it. And I know it sounds cheesy to quote the Dalai Lama, but I love him, Um, which is they said, what is the most perplexing thing to you? And he says, I cannot understand why someone wants so many things that they have to work so hard to make money to make those things. And then they get sick and they have to pay a lot of money because they're so sick because they've worked so much. He says, that is perplexing to me. Yeah. And I was like, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> that's me. That's everybody. I yeah. Mean- and, and since that day, I, I came home to Jeremy and I'm like, we need to sell our house. Let's make this super simple so we don't have to work anymore. I don't give any more hoots about making tons of money. I mean, I, P.S. I do like wink, wink, <laughs> like I still like to make money, but, but that blew my mind. Cause all of a sudden I was like, that's exactly the problem here. Like, yeah, I'm, we're running around, like we need to have work more so we can buy a nicer house so we could live in Los Angeles so we can buy our kids nicer things. And it's just like, what? So that for me was like, oh, and I did a new turn at that point. Well, yeah. Why go to work away from your ho- house that you're working for to pay for? that you can spend very little time in you know so it's kind of like I thought that was very interesting yeah um yeah not as eloquent as the Dalai Lama but (laughs) I kind of I kind of feel you brother no I do I I really do that that's that's what I call financial freedom is having as lower bills as possible (laughs) that's been the shift that's been the shift right is you know it was fun we literally went through I will, after that, I read like all of the money books and, you know, like the best selling money books. Do you have and any the, suggestions? Oh, we're on I loved Total Money Makeover, but he, it had, have you read it? No, not yet, but I'll put it on my list. Oh my gosh. So it's Dave Ramsey. I love Dave but, Ramsey. I just okay. read his daughter's book. Um, yes. So the thing is, if you listen to it audio, on audiobook, don't do that because <laughs> It feels it's like in Espanol. it feels like no, it feels like he's yelling at you the whole time. <laughs> if, if you read it, it's really quite eloquent. But if okay. he, the way he says it is like he's giving you a four hour lecture. <laughs> <laughs> and after I got off, I was really like, bad when you're like narrated by Jim Cramer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. But the cool thing is, and this is the thing I loved from it, is he's like, go over all of your bills and get rid of everything. Like, you don't need half the crap that you have. And I yeah. went through and I was like, I don't need Apple music. Sorry, Apple. Like I don't like, I don't Except need- Apple podcast, which is free. <laughs> don't forget yes, to but- subscribe to the money party <laughs> podcast and give us a five-star review. Exactly. Go on. Exactly. Totally. That's the thing. You can do things for free. And there was all these crap that I had, you know, Hulu accounts and yep. extra Netflix and, and ABC mouse and stuff we don't need. And it was so refreshing to be like, we don't need this anymore. So yeah. that, that was, that was big for me. Yeah. That's, that's massive. We're due for a cleanup. We are. We really are. Oh, I did a, I did a major cleanup when I started my business because uh, I think it was like 400 something dollars to file. And we literally did not have the money to do it to like mm-hmm. set up an LLC. And that's what I, that was my, what I looked at is, oh, I can't start my business because I don't have a license yet. Or, you know, I haven't filed yet. So I canceled um, all that random crap I had. Yeah. I can't even remember what it was now. Like that's how unimportant. Didn't need it. Yeah. Yeah. Canceled it at all. Took that money. I even said to you, I was like, hey, I canceled all these. So I got enough money to do this. Yeah. And you were like, do it. And I was like, <laughs> oh, <man." laughs> exactly. You're make a good team sometimes. No. <laughs> no, exactly. Exactly. And that, I think that is, it's so, and again, I think that, if that's the beautiful day to do hard things. Cause I think our anxiety is like, no, no, keep everything the same. And we need the net, we need it all the Netflix and the Amazon, Amazon, all that stuff, because you know, what if we need something, but when what if just, I need to see it or what if one and, of your friends talk about it, what are you going to be yeah. poor? What if I need have... to do watch Super Bowl once a yeah. year? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's just, it's really fun to be like, no, I go back to the bare basics. You know, it's, it's, it's cool. It's really cool. It seems empowering. It's just yeah. like making that hard decision, right? Or yeah. taking that hard step. Yeah. And that bill. Unpaying, yeah. not having to pay it anymore. <laughs> like that, well, that's it, yeah. right? Like, Is yeah. yeah. Talking yeah. yourself out of it. Don't need that anymore. That's a big no. step. No, what I can we unsubscribe from right now? If we were to unsubscribe from something. Right now? Yeah. Mm, probably Hulu. Whenever we'll use it. I watch the news on Hulu. Oh, geez. 
<laughs> but you can you can watch the news on YouTube. Really? Yeah. Yeah. But I'm so sick of the ads on YouTube. There's so <laughs> many ads. There's oh. ads on Hulu. We don't have the highest version. Oh my gosh, Rowan. <laughs> so Rowan, our five year old, was trying to watch hockey today on Hulu, which it's live TV, and he was getting so pissed because there was ads. <laughs> he couldn't. Oh, skip. <laughs> see, my kids are the opposite because we don't let them watch anything with ads, and they were like, "Ads. <laughs> we love ads." <laughs> They look Mom, I may have chronic heartburn. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, they're like, no, what is that? What is that drink with the red sign? Oh, yeah. Coca-Cola. Uh, <laughs> we have Coca-Cola. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think if I had to cancel something right now, I'd probably cancel my Strava premium subscription. Oh. Oh, yeah. But you don't I'm have I'm telling gym. you. See, look, we talk each other out of it, but you don't have a gym account, so. I know, but I'll still, I'll still <laughs> no, ride my bike regardless of. Oh, you know what I can cancel not. that I pay for? What? A, a timer, that a workout timer. Oh, really? Yeah. I'll no, get the free no. one with an ad on it. I couldn't get the free one because I can only use it once a day. Oh. <laughs> no, so, so th- we're talking like- cancel culture in a whole new <laughs> way here. No, I'm Everybody, for it. I'm cancel for culture. <laughs> cancel I'm for all it. your unused subscriptions right now. <laughs> I'm for it. Try, do it for one month. Unsubscribe and, and try it. Because oh, you'll that's find a good you, point. Don't, you don't need that stuff once you've yeah, unsubscribed. There's a, there's a, a psychological point. side of things, though, you know, that like the social media companies kind of exploit that is going on here. You know, you what if I need it, you know, yeah. I better hold on to it. And it just becomes this thing that's, you just don't even realize you're spending. I'm thinking in my head right now, I probably spend at least a hundred a month in subscriptions. Oh, yeah. we spend over a hundred dollars. I mean, not, not counting business subscriptions for like software and platforms I use, but like just personal entertainment or mm-hmm. yeah. info. It's basically yeah. just info. And all they're doing is collecting your data and selling it anyways. Get rid of that shit. Everybody. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Right now our kids are downstairs for the hour being really quiet because we have that subscription. <laughs> no, I bet. But they would be equally quiet with soft dominoes. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Not well, hard dominoes. It'd be too all, loud. all I'll say, all I'll say is, is um, um, if you, if people love it, they love it. But I think that um, this, this is so, such a big piece of shedding the, the idea of what you need, right? Yeah. I think that's huge. Needs versus wants. Yeah. And, and this like need in terms of like, I need it. Like that's anxiety, right? Like I need it. And that's why I love the whole day. Like I'm not actually like um, endorsing Dave Ramsey. He's rough. He like makes my teeth chatter a little bit, but I love where people actually got themselves out of debt because they were like, we sold everything. We got rid of cable. We sold everything we could. And and my husband, since then we talked about it and he was like, he's really into Bitcoin right now. And he's like, I'm just going to sell everything. Like we're, he's going to UPS every day selling things. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's, fun. it's fun. It is fun. I, I even, I had a quote cause I was looking through my closet and I needed a hanger and I was like, Oh, I need to buy new hangers. And I was like, no, <laughs> I don't need to buy new hangers. I need to sell my clothes and what I have. Ah, so I'm starting to get there. <laughs> oh, there you go. I had a friend a few years ago say like, you know, just go in your closet and you haven't worn it for a month. Just take it regardless of how new it is or anything. If the tag's still on, it doesn't matter if you haven't worn it, get it out. And remember when yeah. I did that? I yeah. had like four shirts and I was like, oh, I only have four shirts. Now I have probably 20 shirts, but I still only, only wear, wear four yeah. shirts, four or two <laughs> if we're on a good day. <laughs> Um, Capsule yeah, wardrobe. It's kind of that that it, I think that hoarding, like even though it's not exactly money, like in the definition of it, it's it's money in a sense, right? You paid money for that, and you feel like you need to hold on to that Mine's because a, there might not be another one. Or yeah, that's my scarcity yeah. mindset, where I just feel like I need to hold. I'm not like a hoarder. Lee calls me a border hoarder. Yeah, um, but true. I'm always like, oh. I haven't worn that for a year, but there, it may come back in style or I may want to wear that soon. Yeah. Or I, I just feel like, what if that one day comes that I need that? Like our costume right. box. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, it's yeah. given us many joys every It'll, Halloween. But, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> no. Yeah, you were going to go somewhere else. <laughs> no. I was, let's get the back to the The tutu thing was talk. just a phase, baby. Oh, shut up. <laughs> Just a phase. Um, so Kimberly, is there anything else you'd like to add in regards to the money and anxiety and how it plays a role? And in- the only thing I would add is this one thing. And I, this is just, it was, it's important for me is um, for me, this is just a skill 
For me, when I used to do my taxes, I used to have 10 out of 10 anxiety. Doing my taxes was like the scariest Mm -hmm. thing ever. And what I found, even when I was a successful businesswoman, like I'd still be like, (gasps) like, this is going to be a hundred million dollars of taxes or I'm going to jail or something. (laughs) And what I found really helpful is actually I did a live on this once is I I had the the camera and I was like, this is me doing my taxes. And I had my computer and right next to it, I had a piece of paper and I drew a line down the middle. I do this with all my clients. And as I was doing the taxes on the left-hand side of the line, you write what your fear is. I'm going to do this as you're describing it. Okay. Right. So draw a line down the center yep. on the left is what you write your fears. Okay. Right? So as I was doing my taxes, it's like, I'm going to owe more money than I have, or um, I'm going to make a major mistake and I'm going to be in audited and they're going to take all my money or I'm going to go bankrupt or whatever, whatever your mm-hmm. irrational theory is. All of those things. All of them. <laughs> and then as you go, you, you stop. And you pause and you check in and you think, what are the facts here and what's rational, right? And on the right-hand side is where you correct it, right? So if your fear was, I'm going to owe a ton of money, the correction isn't going to be, no, you won't, because you don't actually know that. But the, the correction will be, you will pay a percentage of what you made that you know to be true, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Right. And then, or, and then underneath it, you might be like, no matter what, I'll hire the people I need to solve this problem if there's a problem. So as you go, you're working through the money errors, like these cognitive errors that you're making and you're catching. And this is what was really interesting as a lot of people responded and said, as they were doing their taxes, they were overwhelmed with anxiety only to find that it was the same two thoughts. Over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. So for hours they're dealing, they're like, oh my God, that was the scariest should have ever done. Only to find that the same two thoughts got them the whole time. And if they had have just sat down and corrected them, they felt better. I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist, which means number one, we correct thought errors, which is what we just did. And I'm a behavioral therapist, which is where we change behaviors, right? Which would be no more avoiding. We do the hard thing. No more seeking reassurance. We tolerate uncertainty instead. No more ruminating, right? We're mindful instead. Look at sights and smells and tastes and so forth. Um, the last piece. That. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. The last piece is compassion, right? Because remember we talked at the beginning is a lot of our stuff around money is just us criticizing ourselves. Yeah. So compassion is actually, isn't just saying, oh, you're off the hook, you're fine. Compassion is gently acknowledging and validating, yes, this is hard because it's hard, right? Like this is a, this is, this is a, a big thing for a lot of people. Let's go gentle through this. Let's not beat ourselves up. Let's hold space for fear as we do our taxes, right? You can do yeah. those two things at the same yeah. time, right? Yeah. So that's the compassion piece is while I'm scared, I'm going to still face it, do those two things at once. Yeah. And just understanding that you are doing the best you can and the people who taught you how to behave were your parents who are also just doing the best they can. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yep. Right. Don't be too hard on yourself. That's for sure. Right. It's, and everybody's yeah. going through it. Everybody's going through it. So, right. so you're not alone. The next time I have a thought error, um, be compassionate. Okay. <laughs> I really love, I really love because I mean I knew uh you you dealt in this type of uh therapy and um it's just I love it I kind of feel like I haven't really known about it I didn't know this kind of like this thought existed on how to just be like hey like those are thought errors like this is the first time in my life ever hearing that like is that that's such a thing you can think something that's wrong but not bad like yeah that's you're thinking that it's incorrect you know here's what why that's based um yeah in in error rooted in fear right that's it's called really checking the facts check the uh-huh. facts a lot of times particularly with young kids they'll say something and i'll go let's check the facts on that and they have to stop and they don't write it down maybe they do but mostly they're like okay let's check the facts is what i said true no, not entirely true. 
Mm-hmm. Like you said about, we don't have the money, right? Sure. Yeah. We can't afford it. <laughs> you know, Lee's going to use that on me all the time now. <laughs> He's We're like, gonna, <laughs> We're going to check the facts because that's... I need an operating vehicle to drive. Yeah. <laughs> Like, you do that to yourself. <laughs> Check the facts. I will. I will go that's out there right thought, now. That's a thought. You're having a thought no, error. I can. I will check the facts, and it will lead to that. Shelby's having a thought error, and um, I've got to go fact check. Right. The thing. This is what I did learn: is if you ha- if you're with kids and you and you don't want to spend the money, you tell them we. I don't choose to spend my money that way because it lets them know that there's more than one way to spend money. So. Mom, yeah. can we have That's another good. mom? Can we have a Lego? No, we don't choose to spend our money like that or on those things, except for That's when it's cool, your man. birthday and yeah. at Christmas or whatever. Or exactly. no, this time we're actually like, well, why do we get to do this and not that? Because that's how we choose to spend our money. I have another memory that, that like just that. reminded me of, and I'm just, all my money memories are about being at the mall with my mom. <laughs> oh, <laughs> your mom lived at the mall. Yeah. Um, she was like the original Valley girl. Um, <laughs> I, I remember being at the mall and wanted a toy or something. And I remember she said, no, we don't have the money, the typical response, but then proceeded to go to the bra section and buy a bra. And I just remember, <laughs> that's I, important. I probably said out loud, like, you don't have money for a toy, but you got money for a bra and we got to stay in this underwear section all <laughs> embarrassingly. So, so, but that's, that would have been a better, ex- ex- um, description if she yeah. had said hey i don't choose to spend my money that way yeah i need to spend money on this support <laughs> yeah <laughs> i need comfy bras for sure yeah. hold it yeah hold it but you don't see it that way yeah you like we don't have enough money for that then why are you out buying those books or why are you buying yeah. this or that because yeah. we value books we value book like that's we yeah. i talk we talk a lot with our kids about that like what do we value what are our family yeah. values yeah that's great yeah kind of based on these money moments, um, we always like to ask, what's your money, what's your biggest money moment in your life? And what did you learn from it? Or how did it affect you? Yeah, Um, I have a couple, but I'll, I'll pick the most, uh, let me think, no, I'll I'll pick the most profound, which is like the biggest, I remember the most freest thing I've ever done is I'd done a lot of therapy. I actually had an eating disorder. And interestingly, my eating disorder was caught up a lot around money. Like, you know, you had to be thin and you had to be pretty and you had to be rich and you had to be all these things. And I was fighting all of these battles in my mind. And and my therapist was really hard and like made me do a lot of hard things. And she was like, I want you to spend, go and spend a chunk of money. I had money. And I was treating myself like I had none. She's like, I want you to go and just blow a chunk of money. And that's your homework, right? Which is like the best therapy homework ever. What's your your therapist's name and number? (laughs) Oh my god. She's not allowed to see her. (laughs) Or Or him. him. Or him. Yeah. Yeah. She was like, I need you to, I need you to pick something again, sort of this whole idea of if fear wasn't in the way, what would you choose? Sure. Um, and for me, it was, I was, I was again, recovering from an eating disorder. I was a gym rat. I, you know, doing all that stuff. And she was like, what would just bring you some joy- freedom? And I was like, I'd buy like a really beautiful bike, a blue bike where I just like rode on the beach and it wasn't like fitness related. And so I went and I, as a, a for homework between sessions, uh, one week to the next, I had to go and blow a grand on a brand new road bike. I didn't have a bike. I would never have spent that money on myself because that would have been a quote unquote waste of money. Um, but I remember getting it and be, thinking like it was as if I'd bought a Lamborghini. I tell you, <laughs> I was so, but so freaked out, like buyer's remorse, the whole thing. But that was really, I think the first opening of, you know, let the joy in and don't make fear-based decisions. I need somebody to tell me that. Yeah, I'm I telling have you right now. Fires remorse all the time, all the time. <laughs> right, right. Well, and I think for me that was buyer's remorse is ultimately you just beating yourself up for having pleasure. Right. Yeah. Right. So for, you, like for, you don't deserve it, right? Yeah, like, that's exactly. Yeah. Right. All right. So well, I, if somebody's I don't without, it, why do you have it? Right? That or it's like that that money's never, I'm never going to see that money again. So then that's when I go into buyer's remorse. And then that's when I'm like, oh, I sh- shouldn't have done that. Like I right. regretted it because to me, I don't think that money's ever going to come back. 
Obviously it is right. But I just don't have that mindset. And so, right. But that was the shift for me was as I bought it, it wasn't an exchange of money. It was an exchange of pleasure and joy. Yeah. I like that. It was a shift in like, I've got a thousand dollars and I'm going to give you my thousand dollars and I'm not going to see that thousand dollars. Instead, it was, I'm going to give you this money and you're going to give me all this joy and pleasure. And that's what I get to keep. Um, Did you realize that that when it happened or did you have to go to your next session for that to become apparent? No, that was, that was the, that was the part of the pre-work, right? Which Mm -hmm. was, you have to let the pleasure land. You can't buy it. You can't give him a thousand dollars, take the bike and then beat yourself up and not receive the joy. Yes. You might yeah. as well not buy it, right? What's the point? You're you're not you're not exchanging money for joy. Um, you're exchanging money for for criticism. So there was a piece of that already, and I'd done that already with food, right? Like I'd practice eating and allowing joy instead of like oh, all the anxiety around that. So I'd already done that recovery work, and we were de- then doing it with money. Um, so that was why that was really cool. And that reminds me, we were supposed to go for a bike ride, and we never did. <laughs> Oh. You and, you and, uh, you and, oh my, Jeremy, you and Jeremy were supposed to go snowboarding I know. <laughs> oh, every that's year. Right. <laughs> yep. That's right. I forgot about that. And we yeah. were going to go for a ride. <laughs> I can't do Topanga. That would scare the, you know, what out of me <laughs> actually. Hey, when, when I got Topanga my bike is when fear wasn't an issue. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's my values. I value my bones. <laughs> Um, that's when I got my bike is when I met you. I remember oh. seeing the bike. Yeah. Yes. That was then. Wow. Wow. And we had no idea. See, everybody's facing internal no struggles. Idea. Yeah. Don't be so quick to judge people. Yes. Yeah. You guys everybody's are looking across the street. You guys are looking across the street. Look at her having all that money to buy a bike. And I'm holding the bike going, oh, dear God, that cost me a thousand dollars. I'm freaking out. Right. Like if this, that's exactly the point. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I remember going into your home and being like, "This house is beautiful." Remember, we're like, "We got to design our house like this." <laughs> yeah. So cool, yeah. very modern and hip. Well, we're gonna wrap this up, Kimberly. Thank you for all of your time. We want to give you one last chance to just promote yourself or tell our guests where they can find you. Sure. So the easiest place to find me is on Instagram. Yes, your Kimberly Instagram Coleman. is life changing. By the way, you guys write down what she yes. says because this is. Her Instagram is awesome. She just gets on and tells these amazing stories, like daily things on how to cope and stop your thumb from scrolling. Stop that <laughs> infinite thumb for a moment and just listen when you come across it. It's amazing. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. Um, so Kimberly Quinlan on Instagram. Um, I also have a podcast called Your Anxiety Toolkit. Um, and that's where I talk just anxiety tools. I try to make it as like tool based as possible, not just me like you know, shouting in therapy talk. Um, (laughs) And then I'm a clinician. So I can, I see clients. I have seven staff that work for me. And I also have, as we said, a course and a book as well for people with OCD and body focused repetitive behaviors, which is, which is technically skin picking and hair pulling. And when does your book come out? In October. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh my God. I have a panic attack. Will you sign it for us? Yes. Yes, of course. (laughs) Talk about having anxiety, <laughs> putting we'll a book put, out we'll there. We'll put uh, links and info to all of your Thank toolkits, you. uh, your podcast and book and Thank courses you. in the, on our website. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kimberly. That was an amazing conversation. Thank you for having me. your time. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Hey, thank you for coming to the party. If you had a good time and want to party more, subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. If you want to humor us with your suggestions, questions, and confessions, go to moneypartypodcast.com and dial into the party hotline. While you're there, you can also request to be a guest on our show. Find us at Money Party Podcast on Instagram and moneypartypodcast.com. If you'd like to connect with Kimberly, check out her services or pre-order her book, click on the show notes for access.